Modeling and Simulation of Physical Systems Lecture 5 in which we shall study rotational mechanical systems. Just like their translational counterparts, rotational mechanical systems find a lot of application in our everyday life. The lecture agenda items include modeling techniques for the elements of rotational mechanical systems such as torsion spring, rotary damper, and discrete inertia. Then utilizing these components, we shall describe the, the model, uh, modeling assumptions and procedure to construct the dynamical model of a complete mechanical systems. These techniques will be illustrated with the help of examples. Uh, these are the examples taken from the textbook, such as the in engine propeller system, the gear system, and the rolling wheel with the spring. So let us begin by discussing the model of rotational or torsion spring. The symbol resembles that of a coil and the parameter of the model will be the torsional spring constant also represented by the variable k. In its model the torsional spring accepts angular displacement as the input and it produces torque that is proportional to the angular displacements. So the output torque T equals K times theta, where K is the torsional spring constant. So we say that the torsion spring is a mechanical component that generates torque in response to the angular displacement applied to its terminals. So consider an example of a coil-like torsion spring as shown here. Assuming that one end shown here is fixed and we can apply some displacement theta on the other end. Then if we apply a counterclockwise displacement theta in response the torsion spring is going to exert a counterclockwise torque a clockwise torque t so the t and theta they are in opposite direction and therefore the relationship uh, holds when we say that either t equals to k theta when t and theta they are in opposite direction or t equals minus k theta when uh, the torque and displacement they are in the same direction. Both these expressions are essentially equivalent. On the other hand if we enable displacement on both ends of the torsion spring then the expression will change as we saw in the case of translational spring in the last lecture. Now, if we let theta 2 be the counterclockwise displacement on the second terminal of the torsion spring, and theta 1 is the counterclockwise displacement on the first terminal of the torsion spring, then the spring is going to exert a torque in the clockwise direction whose magnitude will be given by t equals k times theta 2 minus theta 1. Pictorially, we can represent these displacements either as clockwise displacements or counterclockwise displacements. So according to this diagram here, both the dis displacements are in the counterclockwise direction. So theta 1 and theta 2 shown by the displacement in the red color are they are both in the counterclockwise direction in response the torsion spring is going to exert a clockwise torque T on its terminal number two usually the torque vector is shown in the form of a double arrow line in this case, the clockwise torque has been shown as the leftward, 
the vector in the left leftward direction double arrow vector in the leftward direction likewise if we think about the torsion spring being displaced by displacement theta 1 theta 2 on its terminals in the opposite direction that is the clockwise direction then in response the torsion spring is going to exert a counterclockwise torque t and the expression would be t equals to k times theta 1 and theta 2. In this case while analyzing torque applied by the torsion spring on its terminal 2 because the torque direction has been reversed it is now acting in the counterclockwise direction it has been shown by a rightward vector shown here so real life examples and applications of torsion spring include door hinges in which the role of torsion spring is to bring the door back to its initial position once the door is open likewise they are also found in the pendulum clocks in which the torsion spring is responsible for uh, retracting the pendulum once it has reached its limiting position or the extreme positions however in other cases the torsion spring can also be used to enact the clamping action such as when we want to put clothes on the clothes lines then the cloth pin is responsible to clamp the cloth so that it remains on the cloth lines and also in case of retractable seats that is the torsion spring is responsible for lifting up or retracting the seat when it is not in use these are some of the most well-known use cases of the torsion springs among several others not discussed here next comes the model of rotary damper so the symbol is usually in the form of a cylinder uh, whose which has two terminals one end connected to the cylindrical shape object and the other terminal is connected to a disk-like structure inside the cylinder but a somewhat easier to draw symbol is like this and we are going to stick with it for our discussion on rotational mechanical system containing rotary dampers the model of the rotary damper has angular velocity theta dot as the input so when there is a velocity on the terminal of the rotary damper it responds by producing torque that is proportional to the velocity and the constant of proportionality is the damping coefficient damping constant b that is the parameter of the rotary damper model we say that a rotary damper is a mechanical element that produces torque in response to the angular velocity on its terminals so a typical rotary damper based on a viscous fluid is shown here it has two parts the stator part and the rotor part in this particular case the stator part is assumed to be fixed it is stationary however the rotor is going to rotate with some velocity theta dot now what opposes this rotation is the viscous viscous fluid trapped between the stator and the rotor and the viscosity and the other fluid parameters are going to dictate the damping coefficient B of the damper 
this viscous fluid is responsible for generating the opposing torque T. Schematically, we are going to represent the fixed end of the damper as a crossbar uh, shape like this, where we say that the velocity is zero, theta one dot equals to zero. The other terminal of the damper that is attached to the rotor can be considered to have a velocity theta two dot that's not equal to zero. Uh, in general. So how much torque the rotary damper shall apply on its second terminal? That is the rotor part. That is torque equals to B times theta 2 dot. And B uh, has, B comes, B is going to be multiplied with minus 1 if the torque and theta 2 dot, that is the velocity, are in the same direction. And that minus sign vanishes when the torque direction is taken opposite to the direction of the velocity. If, on the other hand, we enable velocity, non-zero velocity, on both ends of the damper, which is a more general scenario, then uh, the torque expression will be proportional to the difference of the velocity, either theta 2 dot minus theta 1 dot or theta 1 dot minus theta 2 dot. To understand the difference, we'll have to see the direction of the angular, angular velocity. So in the first case, we are assuming that both the velocities, they are in the counterclockwise direction theta 1 dot and theta 2 dot and the torque applied by the damper on terminal 2 is in the clockwise direction. It is also represented as a leftward double-headed arrow or a, or, or a vector. Then torque equals to B times theta 2 dot minus theta 1 dot in the first case. And if we reverse all these directions in the second case shown here, where the displacement, where the angular velocities are in the clockwise direction and the torque is in the counterclockwise direction, then by multiplying, by reversing the sign of all the quantities up here, we can simply arrive at the expression where torque is B times theta 1 dot minus theta 2 dot. A so-called extension model and a so-called compression model can also be useful in the description of rotational mechanical systems. As we saw in the case of translational spring and damper, we can make an assumption about these elements that they are either compressed or extended. So if we begin by thinking about the extension model of a torsional spring, what we really assume here is that the spring is currently extended. Therefore, the spring is going to exert an inward torque. By inward, we mean the torque applied by the spring on its left terminal is in the leftward direction. Uh, the, the, tor the torque applied by the spring on its right terminal is in the leftward direction and the torque applied by the spring on its left terminal is in the rightward direction and this is analogous to the diagram of extension model of the translation spring it is one of the reasons why we often like to represent the torque direction with the help of a vector rather than in the form of a directed arc and in both cases, the expression of the torque remains the same. Again, that is when we understood the extension model of the translational spring. And this expression is analogous to that. Likewise, for the rotary damper extension model, 
we are going to assume that the fluid pressure inside the viscous rotary damper is decreasing. Therefore, it is going to exert an invert torque, TD. By invert torques, we mean that it is going to exert a leftward torque on its right terminal and a rightward torque on its left terminal. In both cases, the expression of torque remains the same. On the other hand, in case of compression model, the situation will be reversed. That is for the case of torsion spring. We say that the spring is in the state of compression. Therefore, it is going to exert an outward torque. By that, we mean the torque applied by the spring on its right terminal is in the rightward direction, and it applies the leftward torque on its left terminal. In these two cases, we can just summarize and say that the torque applied by the spring, when it is assumed to be in the compressed state, is the outward torque. The expression is k times theta 1 minus theta 2. For the case of damper, we can just simply say that the outward torque exerted by the damper is B times theta 1 dot minus theta 2 dot. Again, assuming the damper to be a viscous fluid damper in which the fluid pressure is higher or it's in fact the fluid pressure is increasing. Therefore, the damper is exerting an outward torque. TD, whose expression is given here. Rotary damper is indispensable elements in several mechanical, electrical, electromechanical, and mechatronic systems. Their main objective is to reduce the vibrations and oscillations which are otherwise difficult to handle or avoid and they achieve that by inducing friction. So in that sense, rotary dampers are responsible for suppressing a jerky movement during the operation of these objects and systems. For example, during the opening and closing of rice cooker, washing machine, printer, copier, the rotary damper attached or controlling the lid of these systems can be used to impart the gradual motion and to increase the life of these articles. They can also be used in the door handle lock for the stable rotation and to provide any jerky motion. Similarly, these dampers can be used in semi-automatic or sliding doors for the soft and silent door closing operation. Next comes the discrete inertia. Its symbol is usually either in the form of a rotating disc or some cylindrical shaped element shown to be rotating about certain axis. The parameter of the discrete inertia is the mass moment of inertia represented by J, capital J. In its model, the discrete inertia accepts torques as the input. In this diagram, two torques, T1 and T2, are applied in the opposite direction to the discrete inertia. In response, the discrete inertia is going to generate acceleration. So this really should have been theta double dot. Acceleration is proportional to the net applied torque, which is in the direction of acceleration. So therefore, T1 minus T2 equals to J times theta double dot. The discrete inertia is an element of mechanical system which is responsible for producing acceleration, angular acceleration, theta double dot, in response to the net applied torque, T1 minus T2. 
However, note that in general, we are concerned about the net torque applied to the discrete inertia about that is rotating about certain axis x. So the net torque applied about certain axis x equals to the moment of inertia j x, the effective moment of inertia in that axis of rotation x times the angular acceleration theta x double dot. So this axis of rotation becomes important in describing the model of the discrete inertia. Not to say that it is less important in describing the models of spring and damper, but because the discrete inertia is usually attached with the springs and the damper in the rotational systems and in the translational system. So if we can define the axis of rotation, that automatically sets the axis of rotation for the other elements. Again, uh, several real life examples of discrete inertia can be seen everywhere in our everyday life, ranging from the automobile engine, electrical motors, pendulum, inverted pendulum, and its several variants. But in case of mechatronic system, the most critical example is that of the robotic manipulators uh, whose prototype is shown here. You can see that this robotic manipulator is made up of essentially two components, the joints and the links shown in the green and the gray color respectively. And their synchronized action emulates the functionality of a human arm. So the rotation of the joints can be simulated by means of the models of discrete inertia. Each joint has its own axis of rotation and the mass of the joint together with the masses of the link determine the inertia of the robotic manipulator. Let us summarize the assumptions made in the model of the elements of the rotational mechanical system followed by the procedure for building up the model of the complete system. First of all, note that the torsional spring and the rotary dampers are modeled as the torque generating elements. These elements have or will be assumed to have zero mass, hence zero moment of inertia. On the other hand, the discrete inertia is not modeled as a torque generating element. Instead, however, these constitute the node of the mechanical system. So remember, nodes were the points in the mechanical system for which we wrote the equations of motion for the translational system as described in our last lecture. Here again, discrete inertia comprises the node for which the equations of motion will be written. So on discrete inertia's node, we are going to balance the forces from the nearby dampers in the spring. Each node has a separate mass moment of inertia, which can be zero at times, and has a well-defined axis of rotation. And as needless to say, we're going to write down the equations of motion for each node separately. In the end, we may wish to combine these equations of motion to construct the complete description of the model of dynamical system, either in the form of differential equation, state space, or the transfer function. 
Our first example is that of an engine driving the propeller. The diagram shown here indicates that we have an engine which is connected to a propeller by means of a long drive shaft. And the assumptions about the engine is that it is modeled as a discrete inertia rotating about certain axis x shown here. There's an axis about which this engine part is going to rotate. And it is the same axis about which the propeller is also rotating. The drive shaft model is in the form of a torsional spring. And that's because the shaft, number one, it is long enough. And number two, it can afford to have some twist without breaking. Assuming that the spring constant is K. The other system parameters include the mass moment of inertia of engine JE, the mass moment of inertia of the propeller, and the coefficient of the rotary damper. The torque is generated by the engine that is T and it is applied to this engine part representing the mass moment of inertia JE. So the input torque is T. The other important component of the system is the inclusion of this damping effect that arises basically due to the friction experienced by this rotating propeller. So the friction part is modeled as the damper, rotary damper, whose one end is connected to, to the propeller, having a mass moment of, moment of inertia JP. The other end is stationary. So in order to write the equations of motion, um, we can write down the equation for, first of all, Two nodes we need to we need to identify the nodes the first one is the inertia je the torques acting on the inertia are the input torque t and the torque due to the torsional spring that is ts then the equation will be T minus T S equals to J E theta one double dot where theta one is the angular displacement of the engine. The expression of T S can be obtained either by assuming spring to be in the compression state or the extension state, so called. In either case, the expression turns out to be K times theta one minus theta two. In this case, we have assumed the rotary spring to be in the state of compression. So if we plug in the expression of TS, the final equation will be the input torque equals to JE times theta one double dot plus K times theta one minus K times theta two. Let us now write the equation of motion for the other node where we have moment of inertia JP. The torques acting on JP include the spring torque and the damper torque. They are shown to be acting in the opposite direction. So the equation, the main equation of motion will be TS minus TD equals to JP times theta two double dot. Note the sign that TS has a positive sign and TD has negative sign. That's because the torque TS is in the same direction as theta 2. Because we know that the rightward torque is a counterclockwise torque and this theta 2 is also in the counterclockwise direction. In contrast, the damper torque is acting leftward which is a clockwise torque. So therefore, 
it has a negative sign. So once again, the signs of the torque become important in writing the equations of motion. You just have to see the you have, have to match the sign of the torque with respect to the angular displacement part that comprises the right hand side of the equation. So we say that the torques which are in the same direction of theta 2 will have positive signs such as Ts. The torque which have which have a direction opposite to theta dot, theta 2 double dot will have a negative sign. And the final expression is shown here where k theta 1 dot equals jp theta 2 double dot plus b times theta 2 dot plus k times theta 2. Next example is a gear system in which we shall learn to model friction. In the diagram shown here, we have two gears which are meshed together and they have corresponding mass moment of inertia J1 and J2 with corresponding direction of rotation theta1 and theta2 as shown. Note that theta1 and theta2 they are in the opposite direction uh, based upon the intuition that if one gear rotates in the counterclockwise direction the other is going to rotate in the clockwise direction. Main objective of this particular example is how can we model the frictional aspect when two masses or the discrete inertia come in contact with each other. So to understand this we'll refer to an example in the textbook of the model of the machine parts. So in that example we have a mass M1 connected to the spring whose other end is rigid, fixed. And on top of this mass, we have another mass, M2, experiencing force. And there is some friction between the two masses. But there is no friction uh, between M1 and the surface. So the, this bottom surface is essentially frictionless. So if we want to build a model of that translational mechanical system, we might want to, we, we, we shall, we would represent friction by means of a damping element, the translational damper in this case, whose coefficient, damping coefficient is B. And if we look at this subsystem that is connecting the two masses by means of a damper, then we can see that if we wish to write down the equations of motion for m1 and m2, one of the common attributes of the equation will be the force, Fd. So both equations of motion will have a common force, Fd, arising due to the damper, the, the damping effect, as the damper is pulling the two masses inward, assuming the damper is in the state of extension. The important thing to understand over here is that both forces have the same magnitude and they and, and Fd will be found in the equation of motion of both masses. So this provides us with a recipe of modeling friction. It is by means of a force which is acting on the both masses M1 and M2. Now let us return to our original problem that is to model the gear system. So in this case when the two gears are meshed it is analogous to a situation where the two discrete inertias are touching each other and if we examine the region of contact it can very well be modeled as the situation that we have just discussed as in case of machine part example, the two masses are rubbing against each other in, in the vertical direction, however. So we can associate a vertical displacement 
y1 and y2 with the corresponding masses for each discrete inertia as shown here. So m1 for j1 and m2 corresponds to j2. And because each discrete inertia has its independent displacement variable theta1 and theta2, so we can very much relate y1 with theta1 and y2 with theta2. The exact relationship, however, is not important. What's more important is to understand the concept that when the two masses are in contact and they have a friction between them, then they both experience a force, Fd. The force of friction is in the direction of y1. So for one mass, it is in the direction of motion. For the other mass, it is opposite to the direction of motion. Let us apply this principle to our gear system. In this problem, there is a, a torque that is applied to the smaller gear of mass moment of inertia J2 and radius R2 having displacement theta2. And by virtue of the rotation of J2 will have a motion induced in J1 which has mass moment of inertia J1 and uh, radius R1. The radius of the smaller gear is R2. To analyze the system, we first need to separate the two gears and in the, draw their independent free body diagram. And remember, the force of friction model needs to take into account the fact that the force the frictional force is acting in the direction of motion for one gear and opposite to the direction of motion for the other gear. We can very well solve this problem by choosing Fd here in the upward direction and Fd on the other gear in the downward direction without any consequence. Now we can write down the equations of motion for each node separately. For the case of node J1, it has, it is connected to the spring on one side, spring constant K, and it experiences a force, Fd, the friction force. And this friction force is responsible for its opposite, for its rotation that is opposite to theta 1. Why is that? Because over here the friction force is rotating uh, the mass moment of inertia, the discrete inertia J1 in the direction of theta 1. So yes, um, I mistakenly said but this, for, this is a torque Fd times R1 the torque comes about when you multiply this force Fd with the radius R1 and it is in the same direction as theta1. There is another torque that is acting on J1 that is Ts. It is opposing the motion. So the equation of motion says Fd times R1 minus Ts equals to J1 theta1 double dot. And the Ts expression can be found easily. That is Ts equal to k times theta 1. Here we are assuming that the torsional spring is in the state of extension. The final expression is shown here in equation 1. For the other node, J2, it also experiences frictional force. However, this frictional force is opposing the motion. So it comes with a negative sign on the left hand side of the equation. Multiply by R2, this gives an opposing torque. The applied torque T here is in the direction of theta 2 double dot, so it comes with a positive sign. So the equation of motion reads 
T minus FD times R2 equals to J2 theta 2 double dot. As part of your homework exercise, you note first that FD is a common factor in both the equation. It's a common element. So you can eliminate FD from the expression and utilize the fact that the linear displacement in the gears remains conserved. That is R1 theta 1 equals R2 theta 2. And in the end, show that the gear system model based upon equation 1 and 2 and the simplification assumptions by eliminating FD, we arrive at the expression also given in the book. And finally, the ratio between the radii of the two gears is known as the gear ratio. And if we assume that the dimension of the teeth on the gears is the same for both the for, for both the gears, then R1 over R2 is same as the number of teeth N1 on the gear 1 divided by number of teeth N2 on gear number 2. That defines that ratio defines the gear ratio. Our final example includes a rolling wheel and the spring problem. However, first we should note that this is not an example of a pure rotational system. It is an example of a hybrid mechanical system based upon the translational as well as rotational elements. Anyways, so there is a wheel that is rolling on a surface offering friction. So this time there is some friction between the the wheel and the surface on which it is rolling and the center of the wheel is connected to the spring whose other end has zero displacement. A force F is applied which is responsible for the motion of the wheel. The radius of the wheel is R and the angular rotation theta is in the clockwise direction. Now one, we can easily see that because of this angular rotation, we also have a linear displacement x that is proportional to theta. So x equals to r theta. So if we want to write down the equations of motion for this whole system, we first need to identify the rotary part of the system and the translational part of the system. In other words, we have to think about a single load represented by the wheel as having a dual role here. It is offering a rotational motion and it is also demonstrating a translational motion. And that's because when the wheel rotates, the center point, also the center of gravity, is going to be displaced by some linear displacement x. So it has an element of linear displacement. Therefore, um, it has an aspect of a translational motion by virtue of that. However, mainly it is a rotational element of the mechanical system. So we need to think about the torques acting on the wheel. So there is a torque F due to F that is the applied force. The torque expression due to this force will be F times the radius of the wheel R. However, there is an opposing torque due to the friction. That opposing torque Tf is equal to the frictional force represented by small f multiplied by r. So the equation of motion as far as the rotational role of the wheel is concerned, that is T minus Tf equals to J times theta double dot. 
and plugging in the expression of the torque applied torque t that is fr and the expression for the opposing torque tf is fr again the signs are important the applied torque is in the direction of theta and the frictional torque is opposite to the direction of theta therefore it has negative sign the translational component assumes forces so in this case we'll have to consider the forces acting on the wheel considering this as the mass uh, that we used as an element of the translational mechanical system these forces are supposed to be acting on the center of gravity or the center of the mass which are the same in this case so what are the forces acting on the center of the mass well there is a spring force the force to the spring that is fs whose expression is fs equals to k times x the other force is the applied force f as well as the friction force small f so the friction force f and the applied force f they are acting in the same direction however once again note that um, without any consequence we can reverse the direction of friction force and rewrite the equation without changing the end result therefore as part of your homework exercise you will be required to eliminate f from the equation of motion and obtain the final expression that is given in equation 3.100 anyways the equation of motion for the translational aspect of this wheel will read f plus frictional force f minus fs that is spring force equals to mx double dot so once again note that the frictional force is opposing the rotational motion in the form of opposing torque and it is assisting the displacement along the translational um, axis that is the displacement the rightward linear displacement of the mass With the help of three examples covered in the lecture for the rotational mechanical system, I hope to introduce the basic modeling techniques for these systems. I hope you enjoyed the lectures and I'm sure you will have a lot of questions. For that, we are going to have a Q&A session on Thursday afternoon starting at 2 p.m. So till then, stay safe and bye-bye. Thank you.